Does meiosis make you feel mortified? Does a monohybrid cross mystify you and a dihybrid cross leave you feeling dizzy? That's completely normal. Unit 5 of AP Bio Heredity is full of tough stuff. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and unsure of yourself. But if your biology education has made you feel that way, that's really unfortunate because Unit 5 Heredity is full of fabulous stuff. It's about how parents' traits get passed to their offspring. And we're going to look at that on both a cellular level, looking at meiosis, and on an informational level, looking at genetics. We're going to start with meiosis. That'll lead us to sex determination. And that'll lead us to an investigation of what can go wrong in meiosis. Then Mendelian genetics. We'll start with key concepts. We'll look at monohybrid crosses and dihybrid crosses. Then non-Mendelian genetics, which includes linkage and recombination, sex-linked alleles, non-nuclear inheritance, and genotype environment interaction. I'm Mr. W from learn-biology.com, where we believe that if you're really going to learn AP Bio, you've got to interact and get feedback. That's what happens on learn-biology.com. We're so sure of that, that your subscription comes with a money-back guarantee. Meiosis, the big picture. Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. What is meiosis? Why is it important? What are homologous chromosomes? What happens during meiosis one and meiosis two? What is meiosis? Why is it important? Meiosis is how sexually reproducing eukaryotes, that includes animals, plants, fungi, protists, transmit genes from one generation to the next. It creates variation between parents and their offspring, and it creates variation among the offspring. Describe the life cycle of sexually reproducing eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, adults have specialized tissues testes and ovaries for creating gametes. Gametes are sperm and egg cells, and they do that through this process that we'll be exploring called meiosis. The sperm fertilizes the egg, and that produces a zygote or a fertilized egg. That zygote then divides and develops the tissues differentiate to produce an adult organism. In relation to meiosis, compare haploid and diploid cells. These are super important terms for understanding meiosis. Parents have two sets of chromosomes in all of their body cells, with the exception of their gametes. Those chromosomes are paired. So like, for example, here's chromosome one. There are two of them. Here's chromosome two. There are two of them. One was inherited from one parent, one was inherited from the other. Those pairs are said to be homologous, and that's a term that we'll explain in the next slide. When parents pass on their chromosomes to the next generation, they can't pass all of them on. If they did, then the chromosome number would double in every generation. So what happens in meiosis is a halving of the number of chromosomes. And the half number of chromosomes kind of rhymes with the word half, or it begins with the same prefix. It's called haploid. So notice that there are four chromosomes down here. There are only two over here. What's the difference? The difference is what happened during meiosis, which is division of cells that involves reduction, reduction division. Define homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes are the matching chromosomes that you inherited from your parents. So for example, here's chromosome three. One of them came from your mom, one of them came from your dad. Here's chromosome four, it's the same thing. Here's chromosome five, all the way on down the line. They are not identical. How could they be? Your mom and dad aren't identical, so the chromosomes that they passed on to you wouldn't be identical. They do have the same genes in the same order. But the alleles, the specific code that is in the location where those genes are found, that might be different. Let's use the analogy of a gene as a recipe. Well, the one that you inherited from your mom, if that were a recipe for tomato sauce, maybe that one has a lot more garlic. And the one that you inherited from your dad, that might have a lot more basil in it. Well, let's now think more biologically. If C refers to a specific protein, then the DNA that's coding for a specific sequence of amino acids 
might be slightly different in what you inherit from your mom and your dad. And that might even be to the extent where the amino acid sequence of that protein differs. So the genes are the same, but the alleles might be different. That's what homologous means. More essential meiosis genetics vocabulary. Compare and contrast germ cells, gametes, and somatic cells. Germ cells are the diploid cells that are found in the testes and the ovaries that undergo meiosis. They produce gametes, and after meiosis, we have sperm and egg cells that are haploid. In a human being, the diploid number is 46. That's 23 pairs of chromosomes. In the haploid gametes, the chromosomes aren't paired anymore, so there are just 23 chromosomes in the sperm, 23 in the egg. Now the sperm goes ahead and fertilizes the egg, and that egg or zygote will divide, develop, the cells will differentiate, and what you'll wind up with are somatic cells. Those are the cells of the body, the diploid cells that make up the body tissues. Somatic cells are diploid, germ cells are diploid, gametes are haploid. What happens during meiosis? Meiosis is reduction division. Why reduction division? It's cell division that reduces chromosome number. Cells go from diploid with two sets of chromosomes to haploid with one set of chromosomes. The first step is DNA replication, which we see over here at number one. It creates double chromosomes consisting of two sister chromatids. What's going on? Even though meiosis is reduction division, it starts in exactly the same way that mitosis starts with a round of DNA or chromosome replication. So if you look at this cell over here, there are four chromosomes. If you look over here, there are still four chromosomes, but each one is doubled consisting of two sister chromatids. In step two, we have meiosis one. And what meiosis one does is it separates the homologous pairs. So this chromosome is homologous to this one, this one, this one, and they're gonna be separated. So now each of the resulting gametes only has one member of each homologous pair. That means it's now a haploid cell, but each chromosome is still doubled, and that's why we have meiosis II. What meiosis II does is it separates the sister chromatids. The result is four unique haploid gametes. Compare mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis consists of one round of cell division that separates the sister chromatids. The cells begin as diploid and they end as diploid. The daughter cells over here are clones of the parent cell. It's used for growth and repair. Meiosis consists of two cell divisions. Meiosis one over here separates homologous pairs. So here we have the doubled chromosomes, homologous pairs, they get separated in meiosis one. Meiosis two separates sister chromatids. We go from diploid to haploid, it's used to create gametes for reproduction. It introduces variation. The daughter cells are unique. How meiosis creates variation. Here are some of the questions we'll be addressing. What are the two ways that meiosis generates variation? Explain independent assortment. Explain synapsis and crossing over. What are the two ways that meiosis generates diversity? They're shown here. The first is independent assortment. The second is crossing over and genetic recombination. We'll explain both of those now. Explain what independent assortment is and how it generates genetic diversity. Note that the phases of mitosis and meiosis have the same names, the same designations. But because there are two cell divisions in meiosis, we have to give them a kind of suffix. So in meiosis, there's interphase one followed by prophase one, metaphase one, etc. Then there's a cytokinesis interphase two followed by a prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, etc. The reason why that's important is because the events that we're going to talk about happen in between prophase one and metaphase one. That's where independent assortment really takes place. What happens is that during prophase one, homologous pairs pair up. And if you think about that, it's quite poignant and extraordinary. 
in the adult organism who's undergoing meiosis, the chromosomal parents wind up finding each other. And what I mean by that is that in the germ cells of an organism doing meiosis, the mother and the father's chromosome number one will find one another, and I'm not kidding, they actually embrace. And chromosome two does that, chromosome three does that. All those chromosomes find one another and embrace one another. During metaphase one, they're pulled by spindle fibers, just as happens in mitosis, to the cell equator, right? So here we have that. But the way that each pair gets dragged to the middle is independent of every other pair. So in this very simplified system, it's possible that the paternal chromosomes might be on the left side and the maternal ones might be on the right side. It's equally possible that you could have this arrangement versus this arrangement, whereas you have paternal chromosome one on the left, maternal chromosome one on the right, whereas maternal chromosome two is on the left and paternal chromosome two is on the right. It's as random as flipping a coin, and that randomness is essential. What happens is that with two homologous pairs, four different chromosome arrangements are possible. That's two squared in the gametes. In other words, what we're gonna do now during anaphase is we're gonna pull these homologous pairs apart. So one possible arrangement is like this. And then in the gamete, we have paternal chromosome one, paternal chromosome two. And in this gamete, we have maternal chromosome one, maternal chromosome two. And if the chromosomes are organized like this, then this gamete can have paternal chromosome one, paternal chromosome two. And this gamete can have maternal chromosome one and paternal chromosome two. Now, you can play around with this. You can make cut out little pieces or you can label coins M1, P1, M2, P2, and you can try different combinations, but you won't get more than four in a system that has four chromosomes as its diploid number. With three homologous pairs, then the math takes you to two cubed. That's eight possible arrangements. And with 23 pairs, like we have in Homo sapiens, you have two to the 23rd possible arrangements. That's 8,388,608 possible combinations. That's the chance that any two sperm cells or any two egg cells would have exactly the same array of maternal and paternal chromosomes. So what's the chance that you and a sibling would have the same chromosomal inheritance? In other words, you'd inherit the same array of chromosomes in your dad's sperm and the same array in your mom's egg. Well, those are independent events. So the same egg, it's one over 23. The same sperm, it's one over 23. You multiply those two together and that's one in 70 trillion. You ever wonder why you're different from your siblings? This is only one of the reasons why. That's why meiosis is so phenomenal. So this is independent assortment. What every chromosome does is independent of every other chromosome pair, and that creates tremendous diversity in the offspring. Independent assortment is a phenomenal engine for creating diversity, but there's yet another one in meiosis. That's crossing over. What is crossing over and how does it create variation? When those homologous pairs pair up during prophase one, they don't only embrace, they embrace in such an intense way that they actually exchange parts. So this embrace is called synapsis. And at a point called a chiasma, segments of DNA will move from one homolog to the other. The result is that you start like this. This array of four sister chromatids is called a tetrad, four, tetrad. And so this is what it's like before crossing over. And then after crossing over, it's like this. Well, you'll notice this isn't really a maternal chromosome anymore. It's a maternal chromosome with a paternal piece. And the same thing for this one. So crossing over creates what's called recombinant chromosomes, and these have unique and novel sequences of DNA. How does sexual reproduction create diversity? One engine for diversity is independent assortment and how it randomly 
arrays different combinations of chromosomes in the gametes. The other engine is crossing over and genetic recombination, which creates uniquely recombinant chromosomes. And then finally, there's fertilization, where the sperm and egg from different individuals combine in a fertilized egg. And that is the third generator. And that's why sexual reproduction creates diversity. It explains you. It explains me. Biology, is it amazing or what? Are you asking yourself, how am I going to get a four or a five on the AP bio exam? It's a good question because it's a hard test, but we have a plan for your success. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial, and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. Meiosis, the whole shebang. Now that we've explained how meiosis generates variation, let's walk through the entire process. We begin with interphase, and the thing to remember about interphase of meiosis is that it does exactly what interphase of mitosis does. It replicates the chromosomes, duplicates the DNA. That's why when we get to prophase one, each chromosome consists of two sister chromatids. What else happens during prophase one? The homologous pairs pair up the maternal and paternal chromosomes find one another and they embrace. They do this thing called synapsis and crossing over where they actually exchange pieces of DNA. So that's happening during prophase. During metaphase, the spindle fibers pull these homologous pairs to the center of the cell. And remember that each pair is pulled independently from every other. That's the source of one of the main sources of variation in meiosis, independent assortment. The way that these maternal and paternal chromosomes get arrayed is completely independent. It's two to the number of pairs if you want to mathematically calculate the number of chromosomal arrangements in the gametes. During anaphase one, the homologous pairs are pulled apart. During telophase one, a new nucleus forms. There's a cytokinesis one and an interphase two that's not shown in this diagram. That moves us to prophase two, where the chromosomes once again condense. Note that whereas there were four chromosomes in prophase one, there's only two in this cell in prophase two. We've gone from diploid over here to haploid over here. That's the main transition or one of the main transitions that occurs in meiosis one. During meiosis two, during metaphase, the doubled chromosomes get pulled to the cell equator and then they get pulled apart during anaphase two. Then there's a telophase where a new nuclear membrane forms. And then there's another cytokinesis. The result four haploid gametes, each consisting of single chromosomes. We've gone from diploid to haploid, from doubled chromosomes to single chromosomes, and each of these haploid gametes is unique. It's genetically unique, and that's what happens during meiosis. One of my favorite music videos is my meiosis songs. It takes what I've just explained to you and represents it in a musical form. We'll just watch a couple of seconds of it. Enjoy it. Meiosis makes eggs and sperm. It's the same in the robin as it is in the worm. Makes haploid gametes, recombination. Meiosis creates variation. Another biotic variety creator is metaphase one with homologs at the equator because how each pair lines up is random and independent. So in one pair facing north might be the maternal and the next one it might be the paternal. It's a one and two shot, it's called independent assortment. Topic 5.6, part one, chromosomal inheritance sex determination. Here are some of the questions we'll be addressing in this topic. How is sex determined in mammals? How is sex determined in birds? What is temperature dependent sex determination? How is sex determined in mammals? We've seen this image before. It's a karyotype. It shows all of the homologous pairs paired up. 
chromosomes 1 through 22 are called autosomes. They're paired homologous pairs. They're the same in chromosomal males and chromosomal females. But the last pair are called the sex chromosomes. Females have two X chromosomes. Males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Unlike the autosomes, chromosome pairs 1 through 22 in humans, the X and the Y are quite different from one another. For one thing, unlike those homologous pairs, they don't cross over and swap pieces of DNA. The X is a normal chromosome. It has a variety of alleles related to various non-sex relating functions. That includes immune function, vision, blood clotting, and so on. The Y has a region that's called SRY. It's indicated by this yellow bar over here. And that initiates the development of the testes during early embryonic development and later on production of testosterone, which winds up differentiating the body into its male form. During fertilization, it's the sperm that determines the chromosomal sex of the zygote, which becomes the embryo, which becomes the baby, which becomes the person. The males, which have their 22 autosomes and then an X and a Y chromosome, during meiosis will pass on either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. Because even though they're not truly homologous, they will get separated, just like how the other homologous pairs get separated. The egg has two X chromosomes, so every single egg cell is going to have the X chromosome. If the egg is fertilized by a X-carrying sperm, then the zygote will have two X chromosomes and it'll develop into a female. If the sperm that's carrying the Y chromosome does the fertilization, then the resulting zygote will be X, Y, and it'll develop into a male. That's chromosomal sex determination in all of the mammals. The fact that half of the eggs will be fertilized by an X-carrying sperm and half will be fertilized by a Y-carrying sperm explains the fact that among the births in any mammal population, the initial ratio of males to females will be 50-50. Birds also have a chromosomal system of sex determination, but it's different. It's kind of a flipped version of the one in mammals. In birds, it's the egg that determines the chromosomal sex of the offspring. That's because the females have what we call a Z chromosome and a W chromosome, and during meiosis, Half of the eggs will wind up being Z and half will be W. The females will pass on either that Z or W chromosome. The males have two Z chromosomes, so when they form their sperm, all of the sperm carry Z. Fertilization of a Z-carrying egg will lead to a male who's Z, Z. Fertilization of a W-carrying egg will lead to a female who is Z, W. That's chromosomal sex determination in birds. As in mammals, because half of the eggs will be Z eggs and half the eggs will be W eggs, the result is that among the initial births that happen in any bird population, half of those birds will be male and half of those birds will be female. Among certain reptiles, sex is determined by the temperature at which the embryos develop. Some reptiles lay their eggs in a nest that's dug in the sand. And as you might imagine, it's warmer on the top, closer to the sun, and cooler down below. These animals develop based on a pivot point that's represented by TPIV over here. So in sea turtles, the eggs that develop above the pivot point become female. Here's the proportion of males over here. So if you're above the pivot point, if you're in the warmer area, you'll develop into a female. If you're in the cooler area over here, below the pivot point, you'll develop into a male. And then at the pivot point, it's pretty much random, 50-50. In another kind of reptile called a tuatara, it's the opposite. So basically, if you develop above 
the pivot point, then you have a higher chance of being a male. If you're below the pivot point, then the proportion of males goes down. You have a higher chance of being a female. And in crocodiles, there are two pivot points, a low temperature one and a high temperature one. In the coolest and the warmest temperatures, the eggs develop into females. In other words, the proportion male, way down. But at intermediate temperatures over here, the eggs develop into males. How is sex determined in ants, bees, and wasps? This is completely mind-blowing. It's a system that's called haplodiploid sex determination or haplodiploidy. The males are haploid. They develop from unfertilized eggs. So here's a male here, haploid. The females which include the queen and all of the workers, they're all diploid and they develop from fertilized eggs. So the mother in a bee colony, just to use that example, is the queen. She undergoes normal meiosis when she creates her eggs, but the father is a haploid male, also called a drone, and he can't really do meiosis because he's haploid, he's not diploid. So essentially he passes on 100% of his chromosomes in the sperm that he creates. The consequence is that all the bees in a hive, with the exception of the drones, all of the worker bees are sisters, but they're more closely related to one another than any two mammal sisters are. Just think about it. Mammal sisters inherit half their mom's genes, half of their dad's genes, so they're 50% related to one another, whereas these sisters inherit half of their mom's genes and 100% of their dad's genes. So they're 75% related to one another. They're more closely related to one another than they would be to their own offspring. So that is thought to be an explanation of why the workers cooperate with one another to help the queen create more offspring, to keep the hive going, to find food, all of these incredible foraging behaviors that you find in ants, wasps, and other social insects. But it's not a complete explanation because like, for example, the termites are also social, but they don't have this haplo haplodiploid system. So biology, amazing. This is as much as you need to know about haplodiploidy for the AP bio exam. Topic 5.6, part two, chromosomal inheritance non-disjunction and chromosomal variation. Some of the questions we'll be addressing include, what is non-disjunction? What are the consequences of non-disjunction? What causes Down syndrome and Turner syndrome? What is non-disjunction? What are its consequences? Non-disjunction is kind of a cool word. So a junction is where things come together. A disjunction would be things coming apart. And non-disjunction means things failing to separate. It's when the homologous pairs or the sister chromatids don't separate during meiosis. There's a couple of variations. In meiosis one, the homologs don't separate. And as a result, so you see that over here, this blue, uh, chromosome over here, these homologs didn't separate, they stayed together. So the result is that in meiosis II, uh, we're going to have three chromatids on this side, three over here, one over here, one over here. So 50% of the gametes are N haploid plus one extra, and 50% are N minus one. So N, the haploid number, missing a chromosome. If non-disjunction occurs during meiosis II, it involves the sister chromatids not separating. In meiosis II, the sister chromatids don't pull apart. So the result is that 25% of the gametes are N plus one, 25% are N minus one. In other words, the haploid number, but missing one. And then 50% of the gametes will be normal. So that's what non-disjunction is and how it can happen in meiosis I or meiosis II. We saw in the last slide how non-disjunction during meiosis I or meiosis II can result in gametes that have an abnormal number of chromosomes. If the eggs are 
n plus one, they have the haploid number plus one more, then the zygote will have an extra chromosome. Then what we have is a trisomy. And what that means, tri is three. Instead of a homologous pair with two, we have three. The most famous example of that is Down syndrome, which is a trisomy of the 21st chromosome, which has various developmental consequences and developmental delays. If the eggs are n minus one, like over here or over here, and the sperm, again, are carrying a normal number of chromosomes, so that's not necessarily the case. You can have non-disjunction that occurs during the formation of sperm as well. But then the zygotes will have a missing chromosome. So they'll have all of the homologous pairs, but one will be short. And the result of that is a monosomy, and most of those aren't really survivable except in the case of the sex chromosomes. So uh, one to know is called Turner syndrome, where instead of females having two X chromosomes, they have one. And there's a significant amount of variation that could happen in the sex chromosomes. There can be men who are born with an extra X chromosome. There can be men who are born with an X and two Y chromosomes. So those are all chromosomal variations that come about through non-disjunction followed by fertilization. Topic 5.3, Mendelian genetics. We've just looked at the chromosomal basis of inheritance, how chromosomes and pieces of chromosomes get passed from one generation to the next. Now we'll look at this from an informational perspective, how genetic information in the form of genes move from parents to offspring. Some of the questions that we'll be addressing are, what are genes? What are alleles? What are monohybrid and dihybrid crosses? What is the Mendelian principle of segregation and the Mendelian principle of independent assortment? Genes are the basic unit of heredity. They are what gets passed from parents to offspring. They determine traits or characteristics. You can also think of genes from a molecular genetics perspective, and you can think of them as a sequence of DNA nucleotides that code for RNA and ultimately code for protein, and those proteins ultimately determine the characteristics of the organism. Describe Mendel's principle of segregation. In your answer, cover the difference between the terms homozygous and heterozygous. Just a historical note, Gregor Mendel is considered the father or grandfather of genetics. In the 1800s, he figured out many of these basic principles that we're talking about right now. Every individual has two copies of each gene. Those copies are located on the chromosomes that are organized into homologous pairs. The alleles are alternative versions of those genes that might have different DNA sequences that will produce proteins that have different amino acid sequences. Homozygous means that the two alleles are identical. For example, in this parent over here, both of the alleles are designated with a capital letter A. They are the same. This person is a homozygote for this particular gene. In a heterozygote, the alleles can be different. In this individual over here, one of the alleles is capital A, and one of the alleles is small a. The principle of segregation shows what's happening here. When individuals create gametes, their sex cells, they pass on only one of their two alleles. So the alleles are together in the parent, but they become segregated or separated during gamete formation. Here that's happening in the formation of sperm. Here that's happening in the formation of eggs. If you feel that that corresponds to the events of meiosis, you're onto something and we'll talk about that later. Define the terms dominant and recessive. Dominant alleles are always observed in the phenotype of the offspring. They're represented by a capital letter. So for example, the capital letter A. So here's an individual who's homozygous dominant and they express the dominant characteristic, dark black fur. In these heterozygotes, there is also a recessive allele, but because the dominant allele is present, then the characteristics of the organism is determined by the dominant allele. A recessive allele only shows up in a homozygote. So this mouse over here is homozygous recessive, and therefore it has the recessive appearance. That homozygous allele recedes into the background. 
when it's paired with a dominant allele. And these are represented in the Mendelian system by a lowercase letter, in this case, lowercase a. What's the difference between genotype and phenotype? Phenotype is your appearance. It's the observable characteristics in an organism. An example is brown eyes. Genotype is the genes that you've inherited, the type of genes that you have. It's your underlying DNA. In my case, my eye color is brown. That's a dominant phenotype, though eye color is actually complex. There are many alleles involved in determining eye color. Actually, I think it's about three, but I'm a heterozygote. So my genotype would be like capital B, little b. How do I know that? Because my wife has blue eyes and both of my kids have blue eyes. And that would only be possible if I were a heterozygote, because if I was a homozygote, then I could only pass on the big B allele, and then both of my children would have been heterozygotes. Explain what a monohybrid cross is and what the results of such a cross will be. In your response, create a Punnett square to demonstrate your understanding. This, which we've seen before, is a Punnett square. It uses the rules of probability to quickly predict the offspring of genetic crosses. A monohybrid cross is a cross between two heterozygotes. So these are peas, which was one of Mendel's study organisms. And this pea has purple flowers. The genotype is capital P, little p, capital P, little p. Why? Because it's a heterozygote, and this is a monohybrid cross. So they're hybrid for one characteristic. Now, the result will be offspring in a three to one ratio. So how do you do these Punnett squares? Well, you start by identifying the genotype of the parents. Well, in, in the problem, it's given to you. It's a monohybrid cross, big P, little p, cross with big P, little p. So you can think of this as a germ cell. It's going to go through meiosis. The homologous pairs are going to separate, principle of segregation. So some of the gametes will have big P, some will have little p. And that's true for each parent here, big P, little p. Flowers are hermaphroditic, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about father and mother in this case. What you do is then the um, gametes will fertilize one another. You know, if this were a pollen, the equivalent of sperm, it would fertilize the egg, assuming this is the female and this is the male over here. But in other words, this combines with this, and we have this organism is capital P, capital P. It's got the dominant phenotype. It's homozygous dominant. This organism gets a big P and a little p. It's a heterozygote and it still has the dominant phenotype. Same with this one over here. This one gets two little p's, one from each parent, and as a result, it shows the recessive phenotype, and that recessive phenotype is white flowers. We have three individuals with the dominant phenotype, one with the recessive phenotype. A quarter of the offspring are homozygous dominant. Half of the offspring, two quarters, are heterozygous. They still have the dominant phenotype, and one quarter will be homozygous recessive, and they'll show the recessive phenotype. That's how you do a Punnett square for a monohybrid cross. In genetics, what are the P, F1, and F2 generations? This is a common notation that's used in genetics, and you, as an AP biology student, need to understand it. The P generation is the parental generation, and in general, they're true breeding homozygotes. Now, notice that we've jumped in complexity. In this example, we're not dealing with just one gene, we're dealing with two. So there's a gene for tallness, and there's the gene for flower color. And the um, alternatives are tall versus short, and purple flowers versus white flowers. When you breed the P generation together, those offspring are called F1s. It's the first filial generation. And in this case, they're heterozygotes. They're double heterozygotes because they're big T, little t, that's a heterozygote, and big P, little p, so double heterozygotes. Now, let's go from the F1s to the F2s. You breed together the F1 generation, these double heterozygotes, and you get the F2s. 
So the F1, that's the first filial generation. And the F2, it's the second generation. It's the grandchildren of the P generation. And crossing the dihybrid F1s. Why are they dihybrid? Because they're double heterozygotes. They're hybrid. They're mixed for two characteristics. That's called a dihybrid cross. We're going to take that apart in just a moment. Define Mendel's principle of independent assortment. Independent assortment its what we talked about in the context of meiosis. This is essentially the same process. Mendel was able to intuit this just looking at the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. Genes carrying different traits are segregated and passed on independently from one another. So in an organism that's dihybrid, big T, little t, big P, little p, the way that the T gene pair gets passed on is independent from the way that the P gene pair gets passed on. And therefore, in a double heterozygote, a dihybrid, big T, little t, big P, little p, four unique gametes can be created. Here they are. Big T, big P, big T, little p, little t, big P, little t, little p. How can you figure this out for yourself? It's very, very simple if you use the FOIL algorithm. That's for factoring binomials. You should know it from algebra. If you don't, just remember it. First, outside, inside, last. So you think about this and you think about the gene pair. So you take the first one, big T, big P. You take the outside one, big T, little p, that's over here. Then you take the inside one, little t, big P, that's over here. And then the last one, little t, little p. So four gametes can come from a dihybrid organism. This is limited to genes that are found on different chromosomes. The game completely changes when those genes are on the same chromosome, and we'll deal with that later. Explain what a dihybrid cross is and what the results of such a cross will be. It's a cross between two double heterozygotes. A couple of slides ago, we were looking at the production of the F2s when there was a dihybrid cross. We're crossing big T, little t, big P, little p with the same. You're going to use the FOIL algorithm to figure out the gametes, and we just described that in the last slide. You just bring these alleles down and over and combine them. You do that for all 16 squares of this dihybrid cross, and what do you wind up with? You wind up with a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio in the offspring, and that is actually something that's worth memorizing. What's the connection between Mendel's laws of inheritance and what happens during meiosis? We've just articulated Mendel's two laws, the principle of segregation and the principle of independent assortment. The principle of segregation, according to Mendel, says that parents have two alleles for each trait, but pass on only one to their offspring, which inherit their two alleles from two separate parents. In meiosis, there's a diploid parent that produces haploid gametes. The diploid phase corresponds to the two alleles in each parent. The haploid phase corresponds to the one allele that the parent passes on to their offspring. In zygotes, that diploid condition is restored, and that's not shown in this diagram over here. Independent assortment, according to Mendel, is what happens to one gene pair is independent of every other gene pair, at least in the ones that Mendel studied. In meiosis, chromosomes assort independently during metaphase one of meiosis. What is the rule of multiplication? Demonstrate your understanding by explaining how to predict the probability of genotype little a, little a, little b, little b, little c, little c, resulting from a tri-hybrid cross between big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c, times the same. Don't make a huge Punnett square to try and solve problems like this. What you want to do instead is use one of the laws of probability, the rule of multiplication. Here's what it is. The probability of independent events occurring together is the product of their individual probabilities. Here's how to think about this. It's like three independent Punnett squares because what each gene does is independent of 
every other gene. What A is going to do is independent of B is independent of C. So three independent Punnett squares, one for A, one for B, and one for C. But you don't have to create three Punnett squares. You just have to use the rule of multiplication. In a cross between big A, little a, and big A, little a, the probability of little a, little a is one out of four. It's the same for B, one out of four, and it's the same for C, one out of four. These are independent events. So you use the rule of multiplication. It's one fourth times one fourth times one fourth, or one out of 64. If you're watching this video, you're probably wondering, how am I going to get an A in my class and a four or a five on the AP Bio exam? At learn-biology.com, we understand why students struggle with AP Bio. The material is complex, the pace is brutal, and the vocabulary is ridiculous. AP Bio is hard. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and inadequate. To get that A or that four or five, you need an easier way to study. And that's why we created learn-biology.com. It's an interactive AP Bio curriculum with tutorials that have quizzes, flashcards, and interactive diagrams that give you the feedback that you need so that your confidence soars and that you can easily get A's on your tests and a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. We have comprehensive AP exam reviews and a subscription comes with a money back guarantee. If you do the work, you'll succeed. I guarantee it. So here's your plan. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial, and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP Bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. Topics 5.4 and 5.5, non-Mendelian genetics and environment phenotype interaction. Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. What are linked genes and how are they inherited? What are sex-linked genes? What is mitochondrial inheritance? Non-Mendelian genetics is about genetic principles that were discovered after Mendel's original contributions. One of the most important of these involves linked genes. What are linked genes? Describe their inheritance pattern and explain which Mendelian rule linked genes don't follow. Linked genes are genes that are on the same chromosome. So fruit flies, as opposed to peas, were the widely used experimental organism to discover the principles of non-Mendelian genetics. And here you can see one chromosome from a fruit fly, and there's a whole variety of genes, sequences of DNA that code for specific traits that are located on the same chromosome. One has to do with this kind of bristled appendages on the head, one controls body color, one controls one type of eye color, one controls wing length. These genes are mostly inherited together, which is different from the independent assortment that we saw with Mendelian genetics. Because they're on the same chromosome, these genes don't independently assort. So like, for example, above, genes T and A in this cell over here, they're linked. In this cell over here, they're not linked. These would independently assort, and these wouldn't. So what happens in crosses involving linked genes? Note, first of all, that we have a different symbol system over here. You can see that right over here. We have B plus, B plus, VG plus, VG plus. In this system, in non-Mendelian genetics, a plus sign indicates the wild type or the dominant allele. If you have a symbol that can be more than one letter, Without a plus sign, that indicates the recessive. In this P cross, what we're doing is we're crossing normal body, normal winged fly, B plus, B plus, VG plus, VG plus, with a black bodied vestigial winged fly. Those are both recessive traits. And note that all the F1 offspring are dihybrid. They're B plus, B, VG plus, VG and they have both dominant phenotypes. This is what you'd expect in a Mendelian trait for the F1s. We have a gray body and normal winged fly, which has all of the dominant characteristics. Now over here, what we're doing is we're representing this chromosomally. B plus VG plus and B VG. Notice that B plus and VG plus, they're on the same chromosome and B VG are on the same chromosome too. 
these genes are linked. What if they were perfectly linked and they never separated? What would you expect to happen? The method here is a little bit different than the method in a Mendelian cross. We're not doing a dihybrid cross, we're doing what's called a test cross. And a test cross, a dihybrid, so B plus B, VG plus VG, is being crossed with a double recessive. And the way that it's done is the double recessive is the male, the female is the double hybrid, the double recessive. I've represented this over here. Here's a representation of the female. On one of her chromosomes, she'll have B plus and VG plus. On the other chromosome, she'll have B and VG. The male is a double mutant and he has B and VG on both of his chromosomes. When the female produces gametes, then half of her gametes will have a B plus and VG plus and half of her gametes will have B and VG. Now that's assuming perfect linkage. In the male, all of the sperm have to have B and VG. Here's a Punnett square. These are the eggs that's going here. The other eggs are going here, the other half of the eggs, and all of the sperm are going over here. You put them together and what you'd expect is that half of the offspring would be B plus B, VG plus VG. The other half of the offspring would be B, B, VG, VG. This organism, these offspring would have normal body and normal wings. That's 50% of the offspring. And the other 50% of the offspring would have black body and vestigial wings. But that is not what happens. And what I'm doing here is I'm letting you know what you would expect if there were perfect linkage. What actually happens in a cross involving linkage? Note that the numbers won't always be the same, but the general concepts apply. What we see is that the majority of the offspring have parental phenotypes. What does that mean? Well, the mom's phenotype was gray body with normal wings, and many of these flies have that phenotype, gray body, normal wings. The father's phenotype is black body with vestigial wings. Many of the offspring have that phenotype, but a significant number of offspring have recombinant phenotypes. What are recombinant phenotypes? They take one of the phenotypes of the mom and they combine it with one of the phenotypes of the dad. That's what's happening over here in these flies that have a gray body like the mother and vestigial wings like the father. Or you can have a black body like the father with normal wings like the mother. Those are recombinant phenotypes. Why do we have most of the offspring having parental phenotypes, but a significant minority having recombinant phenotypes, it's because linkage is not perfect. Genes that are linked don't always stay together. Why not? Because during meiosis, there's recombination and crossing over. So linked genes, because of that process, can separate. We'll see the details of this in the next slide. What happens in crosses involving linked genes? Why are there recombinants? This is a complex diagram, and this is exactly why I created learn-biology.com, because you can interact with this diagram on our website, and you can really come to understand it. I'm gonna explain it right now, but know that that option is there for you with your free trial. In diagrams A and B, we have a dihybrid female and her germ cells. In C, we have meiosis, one with crossing over, we have homologous pairs, they're gonna to get together, they're gonna to swap genes, and the production of recombinant chromosomes. But notice that some of the sister chromatids are recombinant and some aren't. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna complete meiosis, we're gonna go through gamete formation, and when we do that, note that of the eggs that the female produces, two of them at letter H, they're recombinant. What do I mean by that? Well, they have B plus and they have VG. In other words, this chromosome was B plus VG plus, this chromosome was B VG. Well, the recombinant ones are the ones where those allele swapped places. So this is a recombinant B plus VG, this is a recombinant B VG plus, but these two at letter I, those are parental right? They're just like the parents, B plus VG plus BVG. Now over here, we have the male parent who's a homozygote and his gamete, he can only produce one kind of gamete. He's 
homozygous. He can only produce a gamete that has B and VG. Here's what happens with the offspring. Offspring N and P have recombinant phenotypes. In other words, they have, in this case, gray body vestigial wings. That's recombinant. Neither of the parent looked like that. And this is black body normal wings. Again, recombinant. Neither of the parent looked like that. But O and Q are parental phenotypes. O is gray body normal wings and Q is black body vestigial wings. Why are there so many more parentals than there are recombinant phenotypes? It's because crossing over happens, but it happens at a rate that's dependent on the distance of these alleles on the chromosome. And so the closer two alleles are, the less they'll tend to cross over. And this frequency, which is, I believe, 17%, that represents the distance between the B allele and the VG allele on the fruit fly's chromosomes. What's the relationship between the percentage of recombination and the distance between any two linked genes? The further apart any genes are on the chromosome, the higher the percentage of recombinant gametes. In the chromosome map above, genes A and E will recombine the most because they're the furthest apart. In other words, there can be crossing over over here, over here, over here, and all of those will get E to jump over here and big E to jump over here. That's going to look like recombination. That's going to actually almost look like independent assortment because they're so far away. But genes B and C, they'll recombine the least because the only way that they can cross over is if there's a chiasma right over here at this specific spot that would enable little C to jump over here, big C to jump over here, or B could do the same. The percentage of recombination can be used to calculate the map distance between two alleles. So over here, this is a chromosome map, and it's saying here that the distance between this long bristled appendages called long aristea and gray body, that's 48.5. Well, those are units that reflect the frequency of recombination. Over here between gray body and red eyes, that's a little bit under, that's nine recombination units. And really what this amounts to is the frequency of recombinants. So doing all of these mapping experiments or doing all of these breeding experiments with fruit flies the researchers at Columbia University in the 1900s, Thomas Hunt Morgan and his crew, were able to create maps of chromosomes. And this was establishing that genes are on chromosomes and was part of the pathway that ultimately led to the double helix and all that other great stuff. Note that these are not physical maps so that the numbers don't add up permanently, but this should get you far enough to have a basic understanding. Again, on learn-biology.com, I have a whole tutorial about linkage and recombination with practice problems that'll get you all the way there. What are sex-linked genes? Sex-linked genes are located on the X chromosome. Males, because the genes are located on the X chromosome, can't be heterozygous. They either have the allele or they don't. So the whole heterozygous, homozygous thing doesn't apply to males. But females can be heterozygous, as shown. In this case, it's X big H, X little h, a heterozygote. Or they could be homozygous dominant. That would be X big H, X big H. Or they could be homozygous recessive, X little h, X little h. Using hemophilia as an example, how can males inherit a recessive sex-linked trait? Hemophilia is a blood clotting disorder, and essentially hemophiliacs can't clot their blood. It's much more common in males than it is in females because the allele for hemophilia, the mutated allele that leads to ineffective blood clotting, is on the X chromosome. Sons inherit their X-linked alleles from their mothers. So we'll look at the Punnett square first. This Punnett square is from learn-biology.com. These boxes are things that you would drag the alleles into. Here we have a hemophiliac, X little h, Y. It's recessive X-linked condition. How did this uh, young man inherit that X-linked allele? From his mom. Mom is a heterozygote, X big H, X little h. She's not a hemophiliac, but she carries the allele. It's commonly known as a carrier. The dad, in this case, is unaffected, X big H, Y, but it doesn't matter because dads don't pass on 
their X chromosomes to their sons. They pass on their Y chromosomes. That's why they're sons to begin with. So the mom has to be a heterozygote, as shown here, or she could be homozygous recessive, though that's quite rare. We'll look at that in the next slide. Here's a pedigree that shows uh, the same thing, basically a cross between a heterozygous female and a normal male. And note that in this case, the mom passed on her, her normal chromosome and the dad passed on his normal chromosome. It's the only X chromosome that he has to pass on. In the case of these two sons, the mom passed on her defective X chromosome with the hemophilia allele. So we have two sons who are X little hy. They're both hemophiliacs. This daughter over here is a carrier. She received the normal X chromosome from her dad and an X chromosome with the mutant hemophilia allele from her mom. And here we have a son who inherited the normal X chromosome from the mom. She had one of two to give. He got lucky and the Y chromosome from the dad. So he's a normal young male. Examples of X-linked recessive conditions in humans, hemophilia, which we just talked about. Also a very common one is red, green color blindness in fruit flies, which have a similar sex determination system to humans. It's just the X chromosome and the Y chromosome, just like mammals. The allele for white eyes is a mutation that's on the X chromosome in fruit flies. And in fact, this was the first allele that was ever located on a specific chromosome. Can a female inherit a recessive sex link trait? Absolutely, but it's uncommon. Here's what has to happen. The male parent must have the sex linked recessive trait. So here we have a wide eyed fruit fly, X little w, Y. The female must be a heterozygote in this case, or have the trait. So it could be a wide eyed female. Here the female is X big W, X little w. And when we create the Punnett square, we can see that among the female offspring, 50% of the offspring are carriers. They have to be carriers. They get the normal allele for red eyes in this case from their mom. They get the recessive allele for white eyes from their dad. And in this case, they get the recessive allele from both parents. So 50% are carriers and 50% of the females have the trait. Among the male offspring, 50% of the males are normal. Why? Because the mom's a heterozygote. She passes on her, her normal X chromosome with the red-eyed allele to half of her sons, but there's also the 50% chance that she'll pass on the recessive mutated allele. And that's why this offspring over here will be white-eyed. But the key thing that we were looking for was how can a female wind up inheriting a recessive sex link condition? She can if the dad has the condition and the mom is a heterozygote. What is non-nuclear inheritance? It's inheritance of genes that are not on a nuclear chromosome, but on the chromosome of a mitochondrion or a chloroplast. A nuclear chromosome is one of the autosomes or a sex chromosome that are found inside the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. These genes that are on mitochondria or chloroplasts are only passed on to the offspring through the female gamete. Why? Let's look at the example of sperm. Sperm have mitochondria, the mitochondria power, the flagellum that enables the sperm to swim towards the ovum. But when there's fertilization, only the head of the sperm penetrates through the egg membrane or is allowed in through the egg membrane and all of the mitochondria are left outside. So all of the mitochondria that get passed on to the offspring are mitochondria that were passed on through the female germ cell. The inheritance pattern of these mitochondrial or chloroplast genes doesn't follow Mendelian patterns. You can see that in this pedigree over here where the mom passes on the mitochondrial gene to all of her offspring, male and female. But the male who inherits the mitochondrial gene doesn't pass it on to any of his offspring. The male is essentially a mitochondrial dead end, if we're talking about mitochondria, where the female passes on 
her mitochondria to all of her offspring. In the case of mitochondrial inheritance in eukaryotes, all of one's mitochondria are inherited from one's mother. And in plants, they also have mitochondria, so the same rule applies, but they also have chloroplasts, and only the ovule, not the pollen, passes on chloroplasts and mitochondria to the offspring. So it's the same thing, it's female line inheritance of alleles when it relates to genes that are on an organelle, such as the mitochondria or a chloroplast. What is incomplete dominance? This is when the phenotype of the heterozygote is different from and usually intermediate between either of the homozygous phenotypes. Neither allele is dominant. So in this case, we have to use a different notation system. This is carnations and C big R with a superscript represents the red flower color allele. C big W with a superscript represents the white flower color allele. So here's our P generation, C big R, C big R, cross with C big W, C big W. The F1 generation, they're all hybrids, C big R, C big W, but they're pink. It's because two doses of gene expression, in other words, this is DNA that's coding for protein, and you need that much protein in order to produce that vibrant red color. If you just have one, then it's not enough to push the phenotype all the way to red, and you wind up with this intermediate phenotype. One dose can produce sufficient pigment to create the red color. Let's see what happens when you do your F1 cross to produce the F2 generation. So we have a pink carnation, C big R, C big W, crossed with another pink carnation, C big R, C big W. What do you get in the offspring? You get one offspring that's red because it's C big R, C big R, one offspring that is white because it's C big W, C big W, and two that have the intermediate phenotype pink because they're gonna be C big R, C big W, C big R, C big W. Explain how the same genotype can result in different phenotypes under different environmental conditions. This is also known as an environment genotype interaction. And what happens is that factors in the environment influence gene expression, and that leads to variation in the subsequent phenotype. And basically what it's saying is something that's fairly well known, that genes don't determine everything. Genes interact with the environment. And note that this is the norm, not the exception. Here are two examples to know about. If you have uh, hydrangeas in your yard, you can determine the color of the hydrangeas because the flower color is determined not by genes, but by the acidity of the soil. In a more acidic soil, shown over here, you'll get this beautiful purple color. In more alkaline soil, you'll get reddish color. And there's actually mixes that you can add to the water that you give to your hydrangeas that will adjust the alkalinity or acidity of the soil. Example number two is dark fur regions in mammals and they develop in cooler body regions away from the core. This is a Himalayan rabbit, but if you can picture a Siamese cat, it's pretty much the same thing. So this is a cool region, this is a cool region, this is a cool region, and all the cells have the same genes, but the cells that are being exposed to cooler temperatures express different pigment alleles than those that are in the warmer regions of the body. There are many other examples. Height and weight in humans is caused by an interaction between the genes that someone inherits and the environment that they're in. The way that your skin color can change in relationship to the amount of sun that you're exposed to. That is genes being expressed in relationship to environmental cues. We talked earlier about how sex is determined by temperature in certain reptiles, another example of environment genotype interaction. Want to learn more? Here's two moves to boost your learning to unbelievable levels. The first is sign up for a free trial of learn-biology.com. You will not believe how much fun it is to learn with interaction. Second of all, watch this next video. I'll see you up on learn-biology.com. Thanks.